This week's episode is sponsored by The Soul Hub. The Soul Hub is on a mission to empower you to transform your life. We believe that if you are opened up to new ways of thinking, you can create your own reality. The cold water tubs are an easy and inexpensive way for you to experience the power of cold water therapy. Cold water therapy has changed countless lives. They hope to help you take control of your mental and physical health to connect you with who you truly are. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I'm diagnosed with schizoaffective uh-huh. disorder. So basically that's a rapid mood change voices, hallucinations, uh, and red, you can smell things as well. So I might, I might smell the best perfume in the world, but there's no smell there. Or I could smell sewage, but there's no sewage. That's so always scary. So you were hearing voices? Were you yep. seeing things? I was seeing, yeah. This, I'll tell you what I saw. First thing that I saw, yeah. I saw someone that I knew, a, a powerful person. And you had the other granddad caps, the slim ones. And it was down here, and he was running past my cell. And I saw that, and I thinking, bro, that's kind of mad, but I'm believing it's, it's real. And then I looked at my door, and my door was uh, painted red. And just imagine, look, like that. I could see the image of the devil in that, on that door. So instead of being scared, I've got my cell chair, I've just stared at him. And he's talking to me. He's saying like, "Yeah, you're you're one of my childs, and hell Satan, hell Lucifer." And I'm just thinking, I've been chosen for to be a part of this. Now, with the devil, you can contact him whenever you want. And when it's a full moon, that's when he gives you the power to do what you want. I'm walking down the landing. It's my name on business. A, a very serious expression, but I'm not. Uh, it's not in my mind to do anything to anybody. So I've got this thing in a kit bag, and I've got my hand on the handle, but the blade itself is covered by the bag. So I've walked past the yardies on the pole. Rah, rah, rah. So I've just nodded, and everybody burst out laughing. So I'm like, "Cool, oh, what are you laughing at me?" They go, "Nah, rude boy, we're not laughing at you, man. This go on, go on." So I said, "Okay, thanks, man." And when I walked away, it turned. They burst out laughing again. So I said, cool, that's it. So I walked up to the biggest one. I said, you're right. Yeah. I bed butted him until his two front teeth have come out. So I've unsheathed the, the blade. I've dabbed him straight through there. So then he's collapsed on the floor. I'm just thinking to myself, all right, now, yeah, I'm hearing voices. All of you people got in on this wall, all of you nasty people, yeah, anything wrong. You look at me wrong, you step on my shoes, anything, yeah, I'm going to kill all of you. I thought I'm going to kill every single one of you and I'm not going to give a fuck about it. When we're on, yeah, yeah. today's guest, we've got Obi Peddy. Yeah, How are you, Obi? Nice, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, man. Nice to meet you again. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. No problem. Bit of a mad life, mad story as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Spent over 25 years in prison. Yeah. The judge put your name towards 400 different robberies, post offices, yeah. everything. A lot. I think, did you get six years and then they took mm. it to 25 years? Yeah, well, it was... Um, I got to six years and I think I was in YPs at the time. I think I was in Reading Prison. But then once I got back there, they said, like, cool, now you've been lifed off now. You're going straight to one of scrubs. Sorry, one of scrubs. So on the lifer unit. Now this wing, yeah, there's got five landings and there's 300 prisoners on that wing. So when I stepped on there for the first night, it was about eight o'clock. So everybody was banged up. When I came out in the morning, I saw a couple of the lads that I know. And... It was fine. But then the officers, for some reason, because they had heard about me from my previous sentence in Ellsbury, they never came to my cell once. They never searched my cell once. And they never they never looked me in the eyes. I go to the surgery and they would say, yeah, just give him whatever he wants. If I took three pieces of chicken, they'll get four and bring it. When everyone's locked up, they're just like, not. And then it would just be the doors open. I wouldn't see nobody. There'd be like a big tray of chicken. There'd be rice. There'd be roast potatoes. There'd even be pepper. 
there for me to use. So that was how it sort of started with my mind started ticking over. I realised how powerful my presence was. So it was a bit, I won't say that word yet, I'll say it after. So after one of the scrubs, I like, I got kicked out of there for uh, a bit testy from because it's, it, it, I still think about it now. I stabbed somebody with a smuggled in kitchen knife that was thrown over the wall. And uh, I've come out and everything that day. I think I was dating uh, a bird from up Thamesmead and I really liked her. So anyway, that went pear shaped. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm walking down the landing, it's my own business, I've got a very serious expression, but I don't, uh, it's not in my mind to do anything to anybody. So I've got this thing in a kit bag. And I've got my hand on the handle, but the blade itself is covered by the bag. So I've walked past the yardies on the pole. Like, arr, arr, arr. So I've just nodded. And everybody burst out laughing. So I'm like, cool, what are you laughing at me? They go, nah, rude boy, we're not laughing at you, man. This go on, go on. So I said, like, okay, thanks, man. And when I walked away, turned, they burst out laughing again. So I said, cool, that's it. So I've walked up to the biggest one. I said, you're right. Yeah. I bed butted him until his two front teeth have come out. So I've unsheathed. The, the blade, I've stabbed him straight through there. So then he's collapsed on the floor. And I don't know how he did it. He jumped my cup and he started running. So every time he got to like a corner of a snooker table, I'm hitting here, right in his heart. He's just collapsed on the floor. There was blood everywhere. Everyone was out. He banged everybody up. And I'm in my cell, just like, I didn't, I cared, but I didn't care. I was in shock at what I'd done. First time I've done that. Uh, morning came. And there was, I say, 25, maybe 30 officers in right gear. They had balaclavas on, so I couldn't see their faces. And it was, it weren't daunting to me. I wasn't shocked, but I was just thinking, wow, now, now it starts now. So, got a long story short, they took my picture down the said, They said, oh, we just want it for your security file for me to ship you out. But that picture was made into like a, a, a poster. You know, like a missing person poster. So it's got me on there looking like that. And it said, if anybody in the prison system ever sees this man again, run or and hide, because he will kill you. So, yeah, that's what happened. How old were you? 20, 21. Just a oh, young boy. I always go back to the start of my guest over yeah, though. We'll go yeah. through, back through your life yeah. until you went to prison and stuff yep. to get a bit of understanding about you. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Let's go right back to the start where you grew up and how uh, it all began. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So the beginning of my life was, was excellent. Like my granddad um, and Nan, they came up from Jamaica in the 1960s. So my granddad was illiterate. He wasn't, he wasn't educated at all, but he was a good mathematician. So he ended up buying a pub in Brixton called the Angel Pub. Um, the, actual, the actual building is still there, but it's not a pizza parlour, posh, posh place now. So anyway... I grew up there because my mum, like I said on the, my other one, I said uh, she was beat up a lot when I was younger. And it's still going on today, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, so my grandma hadn't took me in. So as the years came in 1980, I was born. By the time it was 1987, my granddad, like, he was rich, very, very rich. So one day he said to me, look, Come, we're going somewhere. So we're going, Grand. They said we're going somewhere. Don't worry. So we've gone to Clark's in Brixton, which was a, uh, an exclusive Clark's in Brixton. It's not there anymore. So um, you had ballet, ballet uh, are like suede shoes from Switzerland. He says, "Yep, yeah, these are two hundred pound, and you've got them." And then that was the start of my life with being a privileged person, but still wanting to be on the streets, still wanting to be with the man them or, you know, the gangsters or in the world and that from seven years old. So I'd see people when I was growing up in the pub, when I got to 10, I'd see people going into the toilet, you know, doing their little thing and that. Um, obviously I knew my granddad was profiting from that. So, so I just turned, I just turned a blind eye to it and I, um, I was good with the profits. So upstairs in my own room, cause I had like a bedroom that was the size of four bedrooms. I had my own uh, snooker table up there. I had a king size bed. I had uh, like a uh, mink bedding, Persian rugs, and it was good. But then my granddad said to me, look, you do not need to go out on the streets and do anything because since you was a baby, you had like six chains on in your first picture you ever took when you was two years old, they were all gold chains. So, you know, um, that's how it was. Got to 11, 12, obviously I met people like uh, Quincy and that and another friend of mine, Ninja, Jacob, you know, Deli B. And these guys 
were to me they were they were people that I wanted to be with. I wanted to go to the little dances and the little ragged stuff and meet new girls and that, and it was exciting. Because I always had, like, money that I was starting nicking from the pub. Everybody used to have what McDonald's, drinks, clothes, so it was good, but then that was the start of the end for me. Did you go to school? Um, I went to school. I went to a private school. My granddad paid for me to go to a private school. It's a boarding school. So I'd be there from Monday to Friday. Um, I graduated from there with, I think, two or three um, diplomas as a youngster. So I actually won Boy of the Year there twice. So that was cool. But then I had anger issues because of what I was seeing happening with my mum. She came to her parents' evening once and she, like like a panda, you know, uh, black. They were yeah. black and swollen. She could hardly see. So I said, Mom, what happened to your eyes? She goes, oh, I fell over. Because of my innocence, I didn't believe it, but I was happy with the answer. So my nan was there supporting my mum. I mean, she's, she was in her 20s, you know. She could hardly walk, but she came with her way anyway. But yeah, so that's the school part. Mm -hmm. And then I got expelled after that. Shortly after that, I got expelled. What for? Um, I punched a glass window through. So I think I was chasing somebody and he was getting away. And then he's out of breath. So I'm carrying on running, I've caught up to him. So I've gone to punch him and he's just moved like that. And I've gone straight through. Let's say the uh, windows with the wire in them. So yeah, my hand was cut up and they expelled me for it. You don't get any, many chances in a private school. How did that affect your granddad? Try to mm. help you, put you into private school, give you a different yeah, outlook yeah, yeah. in life to then getting expelled? That must have upset him. It did upset him. Uh, he's only ever like disciplined me once, you know, like a smack or whatever. But yeah, he was very disappointed. And I think he, uh, he didn't give up on me, but he gave up on trying to keep me away from the streets. You know, I think um, if I would, if he would have said to me, you can stay out and go out whenever you want, I wouldn't have gone out, I wouldn't have done it. But the fact that he sometimes would say, I want you back in by five. That for me was, that was music to my ears because I knew I still had the chance of him. He hadn't totally given up. So if I went out at 10 o'clock and I had to be back, say at 10 o'clock at night, I would do as much as I could to enjoy myself with the man them, you know? And we done a lot. Is that when you started getting into trouble, serious trouble at 11, 12 years old? 12 years Once old. Once you get expelled, what kind of stuff were you doing then? Uh, well, Violence, physical violence, that would scare me. So watching it from some people was okay, but doing it myself, I couldn't do it. But I was useful because I was brainy and I actually, um, I always had money. So I, what I would do, I'd have, you remember the old uh, 50 pound, the gold ones, yeah. the big ones? Yeah, I'd always have four of them. So I'd have two in this shoe, two in that shoe. So if there was somebody bigger than me and there was no one to help me out, they said, I would see your pockets, there's nothing in my pockets. All right, cool. So I've got 200 quid, that's like a thousand pound. And I had that every single day. Is that to try and buy it, buy yourself yeah. out if someone try to like, test you? Mm, yeah, well, it, yeah. That, that's See, what you said there is perfect because that's what it was. I knew personally as, you know, not a posh boy, but as somebody that dressed very, very well, you know, I would be a target. So if I was, say, pulling out that money every single time, I saw everybody smoke a bit of weed, girls go to the cinema, I knew eventually people were going to respect me. And it worked. Yeah. What about ages 14, 15, 16? When was the first time you, you got proper yeah, yeah, in trouble? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, well, I would say 12 years old, 12, one month before my birthday, uh, August uh, 14th, 1994. So you remember yeah. the date, the yeah, exact yeah, yeah, date? Yeah, yeah, I've got a photographic memory. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, what's happened is I've seen a uh, short man, Cleon Perry, very, very good person, very serious, Quincy. And that was it. So we've gone up to Kennington and there's a post office, a sub post office there. So I think short man said, come man, let's lick it, man. That's what he used to say. Come on, rude boy. Come on, let's lick this rude boy. So man's like, all right, cool. So we've gone in there and they were closing up and the door to the money was there. So we've gone, we just walked in there. The people didn't even try to stop us. Open the drawer, no word of a lie, James. Fifties, twenties, tens. We cleaned the whole thing. And that was the start 
of everything. Never turn back. And the judge, when you eventually got your first big sentence, yeah. it said that it was over 400 robberies Probably, to your yeah. name. Yeah. Which is a fucking lot of it's robberies. Much, actually, about one a day. One a day, yeah. One, one every other day. One every other day, yeah. yeah one yeah, a week, yeah. whatever. Um, yeah. still, a, still a lot for a young boy. Yes. Was there no turning back then? Once you st- was that, were you getting a, a buzz from it? Were you... Was that a sense of relief? What was it? An escape? Uh, right, the best way I can explain it. Uh, you see self-harming. Yeah. yeah? <clears throat> it's like self-mutilation. Like I've done it myself and I know other people that do it even to this day. So once you've self-harmed, you've released. Even though there's blood there, you've got a big gash in your arm, you're like, oh, you're right. So me going into a post office, kicking the door through and going in, jumping over Nabi oh. National before they can put the shutters up. Like, for me, that was adrenaline. So just imagine everything in slow motion. You're moving normally, but you're everything around you slow motion. And then bang, as soon as you've got all the money and you're out, first step onto the street, it's just back to normal again. Quick getaway and you're gone. Now, organised gangsters or robbers or whatever you want to call them, they all have a getaway vehicle, a car, motorbike. Because we were so young, kids, teen, like not even teenagers, like 13 or whatever it was, 12, 13, 14, yeah. So we'd go on the London Underground. And because we were so small back then, you didn't have to have a, a card or anything. Most of the people just opened the little barrier thing up. Oh, you guys, you're just young, come on, come on. Go to school, make sure you do your school. So we're in Knightsbridge sometimes. We're in Oxford Street sometimes. We're in Bayswater, Bayswater Swiss Cottage. Now, all of these places are posh places. So, I'll give you a story. Me and my friend Jacob, uh, we was out there. We knew we was going to do something that day. So, there's a Bristol and West opposite, uh, which is Bloom site opposite. Uh, bless you, sir. Thank bless you. you. Thank there. you. There's a Bristol and West opposite Harrods, yeah? So, what we did, we've gone in there quick, very, very quickly, jumped over the counter. I just said, just hold the door. Yeah, and I've gone in there and I've just cleaned the whole drawer. I think I had about probably six six thousand pounds. So we ran out of there, ran into Harrods. Yeah, took the clothes off that we was wearing, bought new clothes. So I think he bought off a Machino outfit, and I bought off a Versace suit. And we've changed them, dumped our clothes in the bags that we bought them with, and then walked out with sunglasses on, just like that. You know, the guy in the in, uh, Knightsbridge Underground. He was like, oh, you guys are so cool, man. Like, what are you celebrities? So I backed out some money and I was like, go on, there's 500 quid there. He goes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm like, there's no need to thank us. You'll see us tomorrow. And he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's the first time you went to prison? Yeah, first time I went to prison, um, I was 14. 14. I was actually 14 years old, yeah. What was that for? Well, that Robbery. was for a pile of robberies, yeah. Mm-hmm. And... There was no getting out of it because, because of my age, yeah, I got arrested, say, 10 times for robberies, yeah? And they they were giving me bail. So I'm thinking, okay, I understand. They couldn't put me in Felton and they couldn't put me in a secure unit because every time they did, Stanford House and Glenfall News Treatment Centre in Birmingham, like, they couldn't handle me. So I was smoking cocaine. I was smoking weed in my room. And then one day, I think, what happened? I kicked the door through into my room and it's hit. I remember a staff in the face and they've just they've had a big stash down there. And within 10 minutes, they said, look, we need to, we need to uh, just take you out for a cigarette outside. I've gone outside. He got he just pushed me. He's like, what are you doing? I've looked around. I'm out, I'm, I'm back out. I've just, I've not, I've not even been happy. I've just thought, okay, I'll just get a bus home. And it was in the middle of the night. So by the time I managed to get home, like I'd already been planning to do a, another rugby by myself. So Brixton, I got back. Obviously no one had seen me. Everyone's thinking, right, oh, he's gone, he's never getting out. Going into the Barclays, I've seen some, someone there, like a sack. I didn't even know there was money in it. He smiled at me. I smiled at him back, took that. And there was four, there was four grand in 20 pound notes in there. How was your granddad still living at this time? My granddad, he wasn't happy back then, so I wasn't going to the pub oh. anymore. I was now just Did you living. feel ashamed, though, at that time? Uh, I did, yeah. I did. And I knew that if I, when I did go to prison eventually, even though I didn't really believe it, he wasn't manifesting in my mind properly. Like, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd never see him again. You know, he doesn't... You, he doesn't do visits because he cries and all that. Yeah. So, you know, I never saw him ever again. How much does that play a massive part in your head, Ovi? No, not the only man probably in your life that's ever mm. going to do anything for you to try and make you, mm. give you the opportunities to then 
kind of fucking it all. Um, do you know what I mean? And kind of going against that. Is that difficult for her? That's for anybody watching that's wanting to be a criminal yeah. or do bad things. Yeah, yeah. There's always that light out there that somebody wants to help you, isn't there, brother? Yeah, yeah. And um, does that play a massive part on your head? Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. It plays, plays a massive part because like, my name's Ovel Piddy, yeah? And my granddad was called Ovel Piddy as well. I'm his first grandson. You know, he's got like, let's say, 12 grandkids, 13 grandkids. And I was in uh, Woodhill. And um, he was at the pub one night, and I think uh, he had had a big win on the horses. I think it was £750,000. So he was drinking, I think, you know them Jamaican rums, but the one that he had was 100% volume. So he's knocking it back, as these Jamaican people do, and he fell over, and he broke his neck. So, yeah, he didn't die. He never died, but he was paralysed from the neck down. You know, so the last time I spoke to him, he says, when you come to see me, and I says, uh, I says, I'll uh, uh, soon, soon, soon. But I knew, I knew he was going to die. He died the next day. So, uh, yeah, I was on the CSC at the time. Uh, I was on association. And, uh, yeah, played a couple of games at pool. And, yeah, yeah, it was hard, it was hard. Did that make you angry? After that? Mm, it made me angry because my parents, my nan and my mum, had said he was in hospital, but he just hurt his shoulder carrying a barrel from the uh, to the cellar, from the brewery, so I had no idea. Uh, but then I think the year before Christmas, parallel times, uh, I was in my cell and I'd come up from Broadmoor not too long ago, so I had a state-of-the-art... Um, acoustic solution stacks so it was like cd dab amplifier and big speakers so i had that in my cell yeah and i was listening to um the christmas songs and you know like george michael one last chris yeah, 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 yeah. and i just started crying and i was sitting in the corner of my cell for about three hours just rewinding it back and yeah i did and there was an officer that worked there, Simon, very nice guy. They're all, pe all nice to me in there, really. And um, uh, I was in the music, so I, I rang my bell and I said, look, put some hot water through the side of the door. So what you do, you get like a piece of plastic, like a piece of paper, but that's uh, laminated. And you like fold it like a funnel and then he gets the water and pours it into my cup. So I said, thanks, man. So then I just started crying again for my granddad and he's come back again anyway. He's done that about 15 times through the night. I didn't sleep. He actually stayed up with me just to make sure that I was all right. And when it came to the morning, he refused to go home. He says, I'm not going home so I know he's, so I know he's not suicidal or whatever. And yeah, yeah, he was a lovely person and that's what happened. So by the time my granddad did die, I'd already cried a river. Mm -hmm. Was that a release for you? Yeah, yeah. Were you suicidal yourself in prison? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've had like probably uh, three suicide attempts. Some of them, are, well, apart from them three, were just uh, like cries for help, which I got. Even though I didn't get the mental health help, I got the help from the officers as well. And what you got to remember is the governors that work there, the ones in suits, expensive suits, the females, the males, like, some of them knew my granddad from that little, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, my mum came up to visit me and uh, I was in the block. I was on close visits. I had a positive drug test for heroin and cocaine and ecstasy. So I was on close visits. So I spoke to a governor and I said to him, look, can I grab an open visit? He goes, give me your mum's number and I will do that for you. I gave him my mum's number. He never said nothing to me. An hour later... Petty visit. I've gone out there, open visit, everyone's out there. He's come and he said, Mrs. Petty, Angela. I thought, why did you know my mum's first name? You never met her before. First time she visited me there. So anyway, he's taken her to a room, like a side room for about five minutes. When she came out, she said, look, see this governor here? He said, if you give them one month, 28 days of no drugs, no violence, they'll ship you out to whatever prison you want, wherever you want. And yeah, I got back to the wing. I had a, I think I had some heroin and 
it's about you, that chance was gone. Mm-hmm. So at 21, you got six years, stabbed a man through the throat. Yeah. And how long did you do in prison after that, all in? Uh, 21, so I'd... I would say another 15, 16 years yeah. on top of that. And then remember I said to you when we were coming in, I done like another three years like in the open mm-hmm. hospital. Yeah. So yeah. Because you've been in Broadmoor. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. long you in Broadmoor for? Um I been I went two years the first time and then six months, then two years. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the mental health side of things, you, what yeah. is it you're diagnosed with? Well, uh, I'm diagnosed with schizoaffective uh-huh. disorder. So basically that's a rapid mood change, voices, hallucinations, uh, and red, you can smell things as well. So I might, I might smell the best perfume in the world, but there's no smell there. Or I could smell sewage, but there's no sewage. That's all scary. Yeah. So when what age did all that start? Uh, that started when I first went to Keen Hill, so I was 16. Does the drugs play a part in that? Uh, it brought it on, but I didn't think it would, though, because I'd, I'd been smoking weed and ash in prison all for the whole time. So, you know, from 14 to 16, before this whole incident mm-hmm. happened, I was fine. But then I got some, some cracking, and I probably smoked five or six pieces of it. And after, when it was finished, I was cool. I woke up in the morning, I, I had a split of weed, and I was fine. A month later, it was just like, my eyes were like that. I was running up and down the landings. Uh, people were trying to sleep at night, and I'm at my door lying down on the floor with my pillow there, saying, look, somebody or anybody, just say, insult me. So somebody would say, oh, shut your mouth, Ovi, or suck your mum. So they say that was at one o'clock in the morning, yeah? I would still be at that door until eight o'clock, just just saying it. So in everybody's mind, yeah, at one o'clock, you we was all having this little banter at the door. It's only banter, it's not serious. But then at five o'clock, you're trying to sleep now, but you're still going on. And then eight o'clock, the door's open. And that is crazy for somebody to go to sleep, yeah, having a nightmare, Waking up and the nightmare is still there. For me personally, that that's that, that's next to going to hell. Do you see? And the head. Yeah. So you were hearing voices. Were you yep. seeing things? I was seeing. Yeah. This, I'll tell you what I saw. First thing that I saw. Yeah. I saw someone that I knew, a, a powerful person, and he had you know them granddad caps, the slim ones, and it was down here, and he was running past my cell. <laughs> And I saw that, and I think, bro, that's kind of mad, but I'm believing it's, it's real. And then I looked at my door, and my door was uh, painted red. And just imagine, look, like that. I could see the image of the devil in that, on that door. So instead of being scared, I've got my cell chair. I just stared at him, and he's talking to me. He's saying, like, yeah, you're, you're one of my childs, and... Hell Satan, hell Lucifer. And I'm just thinking I've been chosen for to be a part of this now. And I never forget that time. But then an hour later, I saw on top of the image there, there was another one on top. And it looked like Jesus, like long hair, beard and that. And that one scared me. But the devil one didn't. Why do you think that is? Used to um, chaos, used to pain, suffering. Yeah, that's what it is. But then uh, the devil, all right, cool. I'll put it like this. I've been saying this to a couple of people that that series that understand the intellect, yeah? The devil offers you, yeah, whatever you want in this life, yeah? You can have a Ferrari, you can have, you can have diamonds, you can have whatever you want. But then God promises you all of these things when you die but the devil's offering it to you now. So if you choose to live that your paradise now, which is really hell, and not wait, that's up to you. If you're in hell and you're meant to be in a fire, you're meant to be burning with chains, if you're gonna be scared of that, you're already dead. So what, if you're burning on whatever, the reality is for some people, I don't think that way now, but at that time, the reality is that burning and torturing and that, that's pleasure. 
Mm-hmm. So what about when you were done that? What about the next day? Yeah. Did you tell anybody? Uh, I I told us. I said, no, you're an intelligent, very intelligent man, James. There was a guy called Sterling. I can't remember his first name, yeah? And he was bonkers. I mean, I was bonkers, but he was bonkers. But it's sort of like a stupid bonkers because he would sort of like do uh, stuff like that. But I've gone downstairs and he says, I've got something on my door. So I said, all right, come and have a look. And it was the same image that I had in my cell, the devil. But there was no, there was no Jesus there. Mm-hmm. So from that day, he stopped acting mad. He would never act mad again. He went down the gym, his arms were like that. And I said, you're right, yeah? So the last time I saw him, he went, I'm fixed. I've been set free. But the thing was, we were he was 16, I was 16, YPs. I met him in Long Larton on Perry Red. And um, I think that was in 2011. And he was still there still doing the same things. And then the last thing I'll say on this point, he says, I want to talk to you. I've got a bit of gear in myself. Let's have one for your time's sake. I've gone in there, <laughs> sat down, he's closed the door, because you can lock the door from the inside there. And he said, look at the door. What do you think was there? Jesus. The devil. Mm-hmm. Again. So yeah, and he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic. So when you see all that stuff and hear voices, mm. who says it's not real? Who says? That's that's what I'm trying to say. But then, as somebody, to say it was the other fellow you was talking to, that one that I told you at Sterling, people are like, that's just mediocre. But then, if I'm saying it, yeah, I could probably prove it because I can tell you three things now. If you get a candle, one candle, yeah? One incense, whatever flavour, and it's a full moon. If you go into a mind state where you're thinking about one thing, you're just repeating the same word over and over again. So that word might be hell Satan, hell, hell Lucifer, yeah? You can send stuff to other people, but you can only do it on the full moon. So Dracula, all these people, Dracula was like, uh, he was a king in Pennsylvania. His wife, his wife died and he got a sword and he stabbed it through the image of Jesus. There's many different myths about it, but that's when he became Dracula. So if I can say to you that that I've seen the devil or I'm looking at that light and I can see him right now, yeah, that's to be believed because everything about me, every single thing is different to everybody else. And my mom said to me when my granddad died, obviously my granddad left me a bucket load of money I think it was like seven hundred and ninety nine thousand pound. So uh she said when you was born there were demons flying about when you were born. And when I was three years old, she said to me, uh, have you seen a program called uh Rosemary Baby? It's Rosemary's Rosemary's Baby. It's a film. Uh it's about uh, an actor, struggling actor in America. He sells his soul. Um, and they moved to her mansion, and uh, she gets pregnant, so she's got a big belly and all that. But then before the baby's showing properly, uh, it shows Lucifer impregnating her. So you actually see him having sex with her. And then uh, you got other people holding her down, spread eagles and he's whatever. So um, when the baby's born, it actually is Satan's son. Do you ever believe that you may be cursed or do you believe in black magic, stuff like that, like all that kind of stuff? Over? <laughs> yeah, I believe in it because mm-hmm. I've got a friend here. Yeah? I can say his name because obviously he's well known. He's a very nice guy. Mark Lambie, yeah? Um, one of the best gangsters that I've met. At the West Ham, man, Tottenham, man. Tottenham. Tottenham, Tottenham man, yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've got Tottenham, man, them, TMD, and you've got a shower. I get on the board with him because, yeah, we've been in prison, they know me, I've been on the road, you know, and we're always all good. So, he, me and him was talking and his eyes, yeah, see his eyes, his pupils, they're red, like glowing red. So, we've ended up in the seg. He's coming down there for a phone. I'm down there for uh, the crime scene that I created. We are split an officer's head open. I uh, hit him nine times with a piece of wood. I was trying to break the piece of wood on his head, but it wouldn't break. So anyways, I've gone down the seg. 
So he's in there, so I'm saying, look, land on the come on, man, put something under your door, because he had nothing, no tobacco. He had um he had nothing in his cell. They were treating him like a, like a what you say, a little man. So I'm like, all right, cool, when I come out, I'm just gonna just come to you down and pull it under, be ready. So I'm going to this cell, I've got like nine screws wrapped around me. I've opened his flap, yeah, he's one like that. And remember, a cell, uh, it's not big, but it's enough to look into. I swear down on my life right now, I couldn't see nothing but his look, but the finger. That's it, it's all I could see, and he had a ring on, like that. He had a ring on, and I, all I could see was that. So remember, I've got the nine officers, they're pushing me to go away, and I'm hanging on to the door, like, I'm just trying to fix. So from that day, he told me a little secret. Uh, and obviously I was getting like books and stuff like that and reading. Now, if someone says to me, uh, how do you, what, how, how are you able to talk like a professor or, you know, about all different subjects? I'll give them an answer, but it would be an indirect answer. But by the time if you know me and I reveal certain things to you, that answer that I gave to you is the last answer that I will give to you. So I'll give you an example. Someone, I said to somebody, how do you keep a secret? They went, uh, I don't know, just don't tell anybody. I said, um, this reveal an even bigger one. And they couldn't, they, the person just couldn't understand till this day. And with the black magic, I got out and uh, I went to seven sisters to see a friend down there. Lambie linked me up uh, with, a, with a bird down there. Beautiful chick. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I've gone in there and there's a guy there and he's saying, Laratio, Laratio. He's smoking something. The, the smell, I don't, I've never smelled it. So um, he says, Rude boy, I want to show you something. Something like that. He had a Glock. He went, bang. And I looked at him and he was smiling. He went, Spat the bullet out, and there was just a little bit of blood. Threw the bullet away, and he says, do you want to be like me? I says, I'd love to be like you, but I'm trying to stay on my religion now, and I want to do what's right. But there's no point in somebody doing religion if they're doing it for somebody on earth. You ought to do it for God. So I would just say, without sounding like a hypocrite or anything, I believe in Islam but I'm still gonna be real about the other side of things as well, because you can pray five times a day, which is obligatory to do that, and read the Quran, go to the mosque, eat with your brothers and sisters from Islam. It's a beautiful religion. But at the same time, with the devil, you can contact him whenever you want. And when it's a full moon, that's when he gives you the power to do what you want. Yeah, there was a blood moon a couple of nights ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. So how did you end up in Broadmoor? Uh, oh, bro okay, Broadmoor. Was that, were you hearing things more uh, no, frequently no, no, or no, seeing no, things? No, nothing to do with mental illness. There was nothing to do with mental illness that time. I think uh, I mentioned it to a couple of people the other day. Um, I came back from the CSC, which is a uh, close circuit uh, centres, so uh, close supervision. I came back after six months and I went back onto the wing course suite. Um, I had some watches sent in to me because you're allowed to have watches sent in with you. So um, my adopted mum, Sharon, she's a Caucasian lady and um, she looked after me. So she visited me with her husband, Martin, and uh, my little sister, um, Nicole, and they came on the visit. So when I got back to the wing, they said, look, there's two watches there. There was an Aqua Masters and there was a diamond brightening watch that I had obviously acquired. So I've got to put the watches on and the next day they see you going back to Long Larton. So I'm like, yeah, got back onto the wing. Nothing changed apart from one thing. You got the Tumbridge Wells guys on there for Lee Russia, uh, Shepherd, Jet. There's three of them on there. So when I've got on there, I'm like, I'm loud. When I'm when I'm when I'm in my element, I'll be as loud as I want. So this guy is always screwing me like. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, what? What are you saying, bro? I'm getting out loud, nothing. So I can tell this guy hates me. He wants to go, he wants to cut my throat. So anyway, um, uh, I've, he said to me, look, I'm cooking tonight. I'm cooking a big dinner in honor of you. So I've told all of my own people, like my, my Muslim brothers and friends and family, don't cook for me tonight because he's cooking for me. 
Bro, like, he cooked pork. I don't eat pork. So I banged up, and obviously, there was a knock on the wall. Tell me about my music. It was on a little bit. So I said, you know what? Let me come out, brother, yeah? That's it. You're, you're, going, up, you're going up there or down there. I'm going to put you there right now. So, you know, we've come out. The officers have let everybody out apart from anyone that I'm connected to on the wing. So, uh, like I said, like, they haven't let him out and the cage fighter downstairs, blah, 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 blah. Gone down, he's broken my jaw on both sides and I've just, I've chefed him and he spewed out. He went into shock and then he collapsed. And straight away they said, look, walk to the block or we're going to drag you there. So once again, I'm in the block. So I'm thinking, all right, cool, it'd be a nick in the court case and then I'm cool. Morning, four in the morning, obviously I was sleeping. I didn't care about what happened. Bang, they've come in, they've thrown grip, you know, like grip that you do the rolls with when it's snowing. They've thrown that all over me, put me on the floor, dragged me through it, put me in the figure four hold, lifted me up, handcuffed me, put me in a, a CNR van with a nurse, and straight to Broadmoor. What was that like? What, what going there? Or yeah, going there. Going there for me. on the wing. Yeah, for me, uh, it was nerve wracking. Why did you do so much damage inside and not outside? Well, um, you mean like violence or? Yeah. I think because money is glamorous. So if you're living a glamorous lifestyle outside. Do you outside, want to jeopardise that? Yeah, you don't want to jeopardise that. And if you want something, you want somebody done, you just say, all right, cool, there's two grand there. You know, you'll give another two when you come back. You know, like. It was Broadmoor then when you were going there. What was that experience? It was, it was nerve wracking, but at the same time, I'm thinking it's, an, it's, it's a bit of excitement as well. Was there any medication then? Were you on anything uh, then? Yeah. <laughs> because you're on tr tranquilizer, you're tranquilizer you? yeah, yeah, clozapine. Which yeah. is the fucking knockout of yeah, 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 yeah. It's mad. It's mad. So um, you're on 250, but they've upped it since you were out to 430, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it is. Uh, clozapine is a drug that breaks your white blood cells down. It can do. So you have a blood test every month. So you got green, amber, and red. If you're green, you're okay. You get amber, read blood test within 24 hours. If it's red, stop it. Otherwise, the next day you're dead. So if I catch a cold and whatever... I would just start a cough, splutter, cough blood up. That's it. Bleed from the nose. That's me gone. So to even be on it is it's a lottery ticket because you can either win uh, a couple of quid or you can win ten million pound. So if any, if I was ever hospitalised for a red blood uh, flag and it wasn't done in time or notified. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be, it would be a, like a golden lottery ticket. What happens if you don't take those tablets? Oof, one day, one day without them, and uh, it'd be hell on earth, mentally or for other people. F for every, for everything, men. That clozapine, it takes effect. If I go back to my house now and I take three hundred, I'll be sleeping within ten minutes. But it's a nice sleep. It's not a, like a horrible sleep when I wake up. I wake up, we have a nice roll up. I'm ready for the day. I miss it for one day, and that's why I'm always being watched. Because one day, and that's it. <laughs> Everywhere. Do you think you could go on a killing spree? Um, a killing spree, for me personally, um, that's something that an idiot would do. Yeah? Not, so, not, a, a, not a mad schizophrenic or somebody that's been cured from schizophrenia but then can have a relapse. So I would just think, if I'm with somebody that I love, for instance, yeah, I've mentioned some names already, uh, and something happened, like somebody came to their car and whatever, I would just be like, All right, cool, go out there, brown bread, straight away, brown bread, and I wouldn't care, daylight, night, I don't, I don't care. But in this frame of mind, I would never do that. So Broadmoor, back to Broadmoor, when you yeah. were going there from the wing, yeah. going there, how old were you? <laughs> I was 26. So still a young age. Yeah. What was that experience like, being with some of the biggest fucking yeah. killers and paedophiles and fucking all, everything under the sun yeah, out there? Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, um, I, I, I would say, yeah, uh, it was terrifying. But then I got up the van... Yeah, they said to the prison officers, uncuff him and get out of here. They basically said to him, piss off, we don't want you in there, we're in charge of him now. So they were cool. I had um, 
Singapore noodles for my first meal and it was cooked just for me. So I'm walking with them to the water to go and get my food and I've seen a crazy golf course. Huh? Crazy golf course. I'm thinking, this is crazy. It's like stepping into Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> like, 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 seriously, literally. Seriously, it is. So I've gone in and yeah, I've seen that. And he goes, you want to go swimming tonight? I says, like, what do you mean? What swimming on the TV? They says, no, do you want to go swimming? There's a swimming pool here. So I said, yeah, yeah, of course. So they went straight away after dinner and a little sleep, medication, quite to have medication to start with. They okay, put me on new stuff, not injection tablets and liquid. I'm going into a sports arena, yeah? There's a, like a, an Olympic swimming pool in there. So I've got like my uh, cage fighting shorts on because I didn't add on my property yet. I've got my cage fighting shorts on. I've got six like gold chains around my neck, two diamond chains, rings, earrings, and that watch that I told you about, the chronograph one. So I've got into the pool, and listen, this will make you laugh. The the sports and leisure staff there, yeah, most of them are female. Like I would say there's 15 females and about five males. They were walking around the swimming pool uh, like it was Baywatch. Imagine that. So if anyone in the pool actually needs help or whatever, they're going round, walking round twice, and then sitting on high chairs watching. And I put my goggles on, and I've gone under the water, but I've not swam. So this went to a lady called Alison, lovely lady. She said to me, why are you going under the water? You're in the shallow end. You're not going to swim, or you're just going to just stay standing and pose. I went, no, no, no. I just wanted to look at my watch under the water, because it's a knacker master. I just wanted to see how beautiful it looks under the water. That day it impressed her so much, we became friends. And I still speak to her now when I go back there mm -hmm. to work. Because you've seen Peter Sutcliffe in that. Oh, yeah, um, Peter. Do you, do you see his eye getting took out? Yeah, yeah, I was there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that day there, yeah, for me, uh, was like a scene out of uh, um, Silence of the Lambs. You know, Anthony Hopkins? Yeah, 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 yeah it was. <laughs> because the thing is, yeah, the guy who done it, yeah, I was talking to him just before, is a big dinner night tonight and it's steak, it's uh, cauliflower steaks, there's chips and peppercorns. So Peter's there sitting down going like this and he's just, he's walking up and down like angry. So I said, sit down, sit down, man. He goes, I don't want this food, I want liver. So his liver, they don't, you have to order that from the kitchen, it'll probably be tomorrow now. So he looked at me and goes, no, that's what I did. I cut someone, I disemboweled somebody and I hit their liver. So I'm like, bro, like, if you want to talk like that, yeah, leave me alone because I'm having my food. Uh, later on, we'll talk about all your your mad killings and all that, yeah? I won't say his name because obviously, you know, but he's, uh, he ain't having it. So he's come up behind Sutcliffe, held him there, took his eye out with, with a fork and hit it. So the nurse is standing there like that and the pus from the eyeball is going into her face. She's ran off the ward, all the stuff ran off the ward. Left all the patients there. So I was like, I don't give a shit, man. I was eating my dinner now. Peter's there crying, the cord of the eye is still connected to him there. Like, you know, it was just, it was savagery. But then once I saw that in, right in front of me, I just thought to myself, I can't never uh, be on point in there. So every day that I was there, I always thought to myself, what is the last thing you're going to think if one of these psychopaths kill you? Let it be about God. Let it be about your mum or your family or your granddad because you don't know when you're going to die. What was it like having conversations with them over? It was it was good. It was good. They, they're, not, they're not mad. They're not mad like that anymore. Now they're, uh, they're very intellectual. Uh, some of them do columns in some papers under another name. Um... Uh, some of them are millionaires. Uh, some of them, their rooms are state of the art. Some people live in Broadmoor better than what most, some people live outside. It's, like, I mean, it's got everything there. Was there a time in your life when you started hearing voices and seeing things when you had to admit that, okay, mm. maybe there is something wrong? Well, well, when did that come for you? Do you mean in hospital or yeah. just in general? Did you realise that, okay, this is a bit too much. Maybe yeah. I need some medication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. hard is that to admit that there is maybe something? Yeah. 
going up here, upstairs? Mm, yeah, 100%. That's a very good question. Well, it was the same day that that happened. I started hearing voices straight away. So while I'm eating my, my food, the voices are coming at me from everywhere. So now you've got Kenny Erskine, the Stockholm Strangler. Uh, he raped old women and men back in the 80s. He was there on there. Uh, and there's a guy called Dante Plant. That wasn't his original name, but I won't say his real name because he's dead now. Killed himself. Uh, Napa, Robert Napa, uh, the Rachel and Kel Wimbledon Common, I think it was. He was there. And I'm just thinking to myself, all right, now, yeah, I'm hearing voices. All of you people got... In, on this wall, all you nasty people, yeah, anything wrong, you look at me wrong, you step on my shoes, anything, yeah, I'm going to kill all of you. That's what I thought, I'm going to kill every single one of you and I'm not going to give a fuck about it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think after that, it sort of, people felt the energy from me. So everybody started conforming for the whole hospital. Remember, we've talked about the most serious people there, but there's over, there's over a thousand patients there. Uh, and there's over a thousand members of staff, you know. So you snippets of Broadmoor, you get little snippets. But then they would say to you, anybody that goes there, you've been chosen to come here. It's not a punishment. Whatever happens to you here is for you to get out eventually. That doesn't matter. You could be doing a million years. Their intention there, all the powerful people in this country will get anybody from that position out. I've seen killers, multiple murders, do five years in there and walk out and go to Reading and go to shopping. Why is Charlie Bronson never been let out if he's never done a murder? Ah, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Charlie. Charlie's a gentleman. Charlie's a legend, yeah? And I've been with him in Broadmoor for a short time, only a short time. And I was with him in the CSC. And he just doesn't like officers, number one, yeah? He was, he would say hello and whatever, be polite, but he doesn't like him. So when we were all out in the association, um, he would just walk up and down, not intimidating way, and they go on the phone, he would walk up and down, do that for an hour. But when he's in the gym, what scares them, because he can do, I think it's 130 press-ups in a couple of seconds, and then he gets a heavy, the heaviest medicine ball, and he does sit-ups, and he throws the medicine ball, so bang, bang. So remember, you're hearing, boom, it's like a gun going off or bomb. So every other, every session that he does, the meditation, it splits open because he's that, he's split, he's hit it so hard, it splits open. So they're terrified, but they don't show it. They can't show it. So I think they would say, if we let him out into the community, um, he would probably do something to somebody so bad because he's strong, so, so strong. Um, I don't think anyone could take him out outside. I mean, I ain't scared of him, but I know Mickey Peterson, Charles Bronson, he's the most fierce warrior, fist to fist, than anybody I know. And remember, all the books that he's written, yeah, some of them under an alias, um, all of the um, things he's done, yeah, he spoke to me about all of them showed me all the books and gave me copies. And he actually was about to get out. And he he punched the governor in the face because of me. It was Christmas at Woodhill. Everybody's happy because we're getting a big dinner. They got trays of everything. He just get me emotional because I wish he didn't do it because he would have got out. Um, he was doing me the drawings. You know, he's a famous artist uh, and he done me too. Um, he said, look, oh, that's for you. Um, I send one to your mum and one to, like, my mum, my Sharon, my wife, foster mum, uh, and send one to your real mum, or dad. So I've done that. But then as I'm going to post them, the governor said, no, you're not doing it. And he says, why? Because he says, these are going on eBay for a lot of money. We don't want, in, we don't want you to get any publicity from it, and blah, blah, blah. That upset him really bad. So I think we banged up. The next thing I heard, they raised, banged the governor in his face, stunned him, knocked him clean out. Uh, and yeah, they took him back to the cages for that, you know. So I think he was just about to go to the court of appeal for his appeal case. And they were going to give him a fair chance. So yeah, Charlie, 
I love you, man. I think that's coming up again this year or next year's yeah. appeal. Yeah. I had him on the phone just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I couldn't say anything. I would have yeah, cut yeah. the phone call yeah, off, yeah, but it was yeah, his yeah. son. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote down yeah, a couple yeah, of questions yeah, yeah. so he could ask, but if I say anything, yeah, yeah, I'd just yeah. fucking yeah. cut the call off. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, but hopefully he gets out. But do you think there's a bit of fear there as well, Wolfie, where people been institutionalised yeah. so long that they're scared yeah. and they actually cause a bit of damage uh, before they get out? I would say yes, because I've done that myself many times. It's what you call Why self, is that? Uh, it's self-sabotage. You get that close to getting out and then you go backwards and then you're, you're actually happy. Then you get to that point again, you can do that a thousand times. But because Charlie's so intelligent, yeah, that was the case years ago. It's not now. So whatever happens with him, he ain't going to let nobody insult him. He ain't going to let an officer um, not feed him properly. You know, so they know what he's like. So if you know that somebody doesn't like something, why the hell are you going to keep doing it? Because you know what you're going to get. In, Bri in um, Broadmoor, if it kicks off, do people get the injection fast or how does it work? Is there people always on standby <sighs> when there's people eating dinners? How does it work? All right, cool. Um, after, after, um, sorry, after six months there, they said, look, we want you to come and work with us here now. I brought well, not work as a member of staff, but in their training. So it's called PMVA, Problematic uh, Violence uh, Team. So they're an elite team. So they're basically a, a, a muffy squad that with shields and all that. They come for you, yeah? But they don't hurt you, though. But they're more powerful than the prison service uh, CNR. So, you know, like, if the bell gets pushed, like... And they're there like that. It's like they live outside of every wing, every ward in the in the hospital. So um, I've seen it pressed, and I've seen them come on, and people have had to go, but then they're down. And when that injection goes in, by the time they win the figure four and they stand up, they're out. They're like like that. Now it's happened to me twice, and I think I'm the only person that actually defeated them. The only person. And I was in my room, I was on seclusion, and I was saying, when am I going to be, my door's going to be open, because it's been three, four days now, I've been good, when you going to let me out? So she, the nurse said to me, I'm just going to go and see the, the nurse in charge, and we come back, we'll open your door. So I'm like, let me, so I've kicked the little grill on the door, and the grill's been gone through, so there's a gap there, straight away they're there. And they're at my door, and I could see, I could see, like at least 17, 18 of them. And they're like rugby players. And there's one woman there as well. She's also there. So they've opened the door and I've got out. So we're, we're I'm throwing punches and whatever, whatever. I'm hitting their visors. But then I've got one of them around the neck and I'm just lying on the floor with him. Like this. And they're, that, they're doing this nasal distraction. Which makes it like, it's painful, but I couldn't feel it. They've done the one here. you got a pressure point here. So he's digging his finger in there. So I've just caught him like that. And I actually put him to sleep and they injected me and I fell asleep with him my, in my arms. How long are you out for when they inject you? <sighs> um, it's not a sleep like uh, where you don't wake up. So I slept for about nine hours, woke up, had a drink. I was having between, slept for another 12 hours. And then on the third day, it was starting to wear off. They let me out. I was slurring. Uh, they let me out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what kind of, what is in it? Huh? What is in it? Uh, it's called uh, Acuface Suspension. Uh -huh. So you know what suspension means? Yeah. Like, like, like mm -hmm. levitating. So when they give it to you, you act, when you're sleeping, they feel like you're floating in the air. That's how powerful it is. Shit. So then they mix it with the icy pan. Mm -hmm. Did you ever surround yourself with these kind of men? Like some of them serial killers and think to yourself, what the fuck am I doing here? Or did you feel as if you, if you yeah, fit, yeah, fit yeah, it in? Yeah. yeah, as long as you weren't in for paedophilia mm -hmm. or rape, yeah, you were good with me. You were good. And yeah, it fit in because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like people, people like, they like to associate with people like them, innit? Like, in that sort of situation. So if I was outside now, right now at this present time, yeah, two, 21, I would never be around people like that. But then if I'm going to the West End clubbing, I want to be around the people that are doing the glamour stuff and looking good. But then to answer your question fully, I would just say like being in there with all them multiple killers, cannibals, uh, people that, I've eaten people's intestines, uh, everything, everything, everything. Like, for me, I would chill out with them all day and all night because there's no lock-up in there. 
you don't have to go to bed. You can stay up for 10 days if you want, go to sleep for an hour, come back out. So prison is no longer an issue and you're promised something better after that. So it's like I said earlier, sometimes in this life, you can have forbidden pleasures or things that are wrong but you can enjoy them now. Even though some of them have done the worst crimes on the planet, was there any of them you ever felt you're actually a good person, even though it's, yeah, it's a yeah, fucked up yeah, question, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. even though they've killed 15 yeah, yeah. people or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you're speaking to them, you're going, how could you do that? You're actually okay, mm, but mm. was that because yeah. they're so, so psychotic yeah, that yeah. Mm. they shield it well? How does it work in there? Uh, could you I see through yeah, that? Because yeah. yeah. I, I like to study people, I like yeah. to understand people yeah, 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 and how yeah. they function and how they do it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I always believe everybody has got goodness at the start of their mm. life. Yeah. Certain things that trigger them to go down that path. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knows what it is, but exactly. did you ever sit around the dinner table having a conversation and you're thinking, how are you in here? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, his name was Patrick Riley. Uh, and he was Scottish as well, but he was a nice, very lovely guy, elderly. So I used to talk to him, we used to do art together because he's a brilliant artist. And I used to do like abstracts. I'm good at abstract drawing, very, very good. So I would talk to him for like two years and I was waiting for him in the art class one day. I'd cook steak, uh, chips and uh, lamb chops and like you no know, cream sauce with garlic and onions and mushrooms. So I'm waiting for him, I'm like, uh, nurse, where's, where's Pat, man? The food's getting cold. Cause he's dead, he died this morning. And that's the only person I've ever felt any compassion for because whatever he did, yeah, like, he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve to die like that, you know. He was castrated uh, chemically uh, in Broadmoor. So he wasn't a danger anymore, you know. So I miss him. And I know somebody that killed somebody in there and the guy had been there since he was 16. And I think he died when he was 78 or something like that. Uh, and uh, he, he had no family, he'd outlived all his family. So they buried him in Broadmoor. Uh, I, I kind of walked past his tombstone every day. And at night, uh, when there's a full moon, there's bats that fly around and land on his uh, tombstone. So um, for that, well, yeah, for that reason, I'll just say, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's really, really a lot. So, how? When? What's your connection then with film moons and stuff? What is your connection with like film moons and yeah, all yeah. that stuff? Have you always felt a presence with? Mm -mm, no. 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 Not always. Nah. Just nah. recently, or just? Uh, I would say for the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, all it is, yeah. I have you seen the film Hellraiser? Yeah. Cool. I watched that when I was a kid, the first one, when Pinhead was born, yeah? And I was always amazed because when I saw the next one years later, and it was me and Yami that I watched it. We didn't watch it with him. We was in Long Garden in the morning. Somebody gave me the whole trilogy, one, two, and three. So he's knocking on my door saying, come on, man, let's go and do where the hit going on. So I'm like, no, I'm in my cell. So I'm just watching these DVDs. And I understood all of it because hell... Is a, it's a labyrinth. It's not like a, a hole, a, like a, a hole in the in the floor. And going through each door is like going into a hotel or a nightclub. And pain, pleasure, people do that now. Uh, BDSM and all that whipping and slapping and um, suffocation. Now, if you look at the Cenobites, Pinhead and all the rest of them. What they're wearing, that black stuff and all that, that spikes going all the way through their body. And they love their outfits. So, like I said earlier, to reiterate myself, to repeat myself, if you're dead, yeah, why are you going to be scared about pain? Why? You're already dead. You're not going to die again, are you? You know? I, I read a book. Uh, uh, it's called... McKay and Pike, they're Scottish authors. Albert McKay, Albert Pike. They re I read a story about them about Night Kadush, and it's a true story. He went to hell, yeah, and he spoke to the devil and he said, look, I know that you're, you're, the, you're like the person of the light for everywhere. So the devil said to him, uh, he said, yo, I'm going to set you free. 
So what he actually did, how they prescribe it in the book, is that he, he used the devil to travel back to earth as a ladder. So you've got the term Jacob's Ladder. That's where it comes from, Knight Kadush. He was a 33 degree mason, a Knights of the Templar. So I would just say that experiencing what I experience on the full moon, if I choose to, you know, do whatever, whatever, that's my choice. And like I said, I am religious as well. And I've got a strong belief in Allah, which is an Islamic name for God. But at the same time, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm seeing what I can see. I'm seeing what I can do. And I'm seeing what I've done. You know, you have something here cut off, yeah? And that piece is gone from your mind, yeah? And then you get another bit of your brain working, yeah? Then that means you're using a totally different part of your brain. It's like being born again and seeing through different eyes. So the last ex the last example I give to you, Jeepers Creepers, yeah? Whatever part that demon wants from somebody, it could be a leg, it could be their eyes, it could be their hair, he takes it off and he digests it and then he gets it. So his eyes will turn black or they'll turn blue or they'll turn green. His hair might go black, it might be an afro, it might be black. So I think with actors, films, the royal family and that. Um, it's not a thing about having power or being able to do things that nobody ain't. It's being aware of what you can do, not what you can't. And people will naturally either gravitate towards you or they will gravitate away. And with my friends and family that I've got, I'm happy with that. You know, and anyone else that I meet, like yourself, yourself, sir, like, it brings joy to my heart because it shows that the people that I attract to share their time with are good people, you know? So if I was a bad person, I wouldn't be able to come into, like, a multi-million pound hotel, you know, and that's it. Share your story. Yeah. How does one get out of Broadmoor? Uh, well, is so that a long process? Mm -mm, no, no, it's eight years minimum, but then that's a rule of thumb. So basically, if you do therapy, which you got dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, and CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and there's another one called uh, the hom homicide group, so you have to do it every day. So you, uh, you got like 20 like, serial killers there, and we all have to sort of like talk about things we've done how's that experience um it's fine really i enjoyed it talking about killing someone yeah is that do you feel like a sense of a weight lifted off your shoulder because a lot of people can bottle that stuff up of not yeah, yeah, speaking yeah. about the trauma that they've caused on to mm. others yeah yeah, yeah does well, it make it easier speaking around other people who's done the same things like going uh, to an AA meeting or a GA meeting where yeah. other people are in the same boat and can understand yeah yeah, yeah definitely I think what you said there uh, hits a nail on the head because I think that um, when people don't talk about things it stays inside so you know you can grow up into an adult with all of this pain that you buried and then you'll treat somebody bad because of it so if a man is treated bad by women when he's a kid, when he grows up, he's going to rate him. He's going to be a wife beater. Where I say, if somebody, um, like, say, I then cool. Say you somebody's, say somebody's a rapist, for instance. Yeah, nine times out of ten, for the people that I've met, and I've, I've just uh, like had a little bit of the SP to find out what's going on with them. They say the reason why I done it is because I was raped when I was a, when I was a kid. So I did it back to somebody else, or that's what made me, my desires want to do that. And that's the that's honest truth. Remember, the people that work there, they're all PhDs. They're not, they're not Mickey Mouse doctors who read from a textbook. They can look into your eyes and tell you about your whole life in 30 seconds. That's how good they are. So when you started, when did you realise you were getting out of Broadmoor? What age? Uh, I went the first time, so 20, 28, 28. When you were leaving, some might be a silly question, but would, would you would you miss it? Would you have missed it? Uh, I mean, cool, yeah, I missed it. I, I missed it straight away. 
as soon as I w get, came out the gate. And where did you go after that? Uh, I went to a medium secure hospital in uh, Brixton. What's the difference? It, uh, uh, not a lot, really. Same people. Because <laughs> most people don't walk out the gate in Broadmoor. A few do. But then all the people that I met at the, the medium secure uh, in my hometown as well were Broadmoor patients. So it was only even was we could have takeaways when every night instead of like three times a week. Uh, we can go out into the community and go to Brixton. We have visits whenever you want. How was that experience going yeah, for the first time yeah, in no, no, 15, no, 20 oh, years? Oh, Were you man. nervous? Were you thinking about the self-sabotage again? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's that's what eventually happened. So I, I got there and they put like a like a tag, an electric tag around your leg. So I'm like, why are you doing this? He says, no, because when we, we let you go out, we just want to run away. We can just come and find you. So that's straight away my heart was going to do, 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 because I'm realising that I can go out. As soon as this is fitted, I can go out. So I've obviously fitted it going out. And as I'm walking through the ground to get onto Lando Road, which is in Stockwell, Brixton, I'm nervous. I'm thinking, if I see anybody I know, that they're going to think it's on medication and that. But... I sort of cut the people that I knew, cut the girls, cut the guys, and it was fine. They're like, well, you're out now, or whatever. It's been 15 years, 16 years, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just at Lando Road. If I be myself, I'll be out in six months. They're like, yeah, man, touch me, man, boom. Or, babe, come here, give me a hug, man. Boom, you're looking good, but you got a bit of a bed. You know, this is general chit chat. So I'll just go there, go and buy some trainers, or whatever, and then come back. And I did that every single day for three months. And then the self sabotage started. Because they, they said, if you do another two weeks like this, we're going to let you out early. And I sabotage it again. What did you do? Uh, stupid thing, stupid. Nothing serious. I think I was having a smoke. And this guy, I looked after him. Little guy, I took him under my wing. But he was very ignorant and very rude. So I said, look, bro, I've given you like £100 worth of cigarettes this week, yeah? Your own benefits. You get like £200 a week and that from your ESA or whatever they call it. And you want to eat my money that my mom gives to me. So anyway, he was just rude. And so I was looking, you know what? Bang. I was just chinned him. just left him on the floor. So obviously the staff come, the bell's gone off, they've come. I says, look, get the bus back to Broadmoor. Yeah. Otherwise I'm going to give you a reason to get the bus. So they were like, please, this stay. You're like inches away. This, this incident doesn't matter. We know he's a wind-up merchant, you know. And I said, listen, get the bus. I said, one more time. And they said, all right, cool. Ten minutes later, the bus was there. I packed my kit quickly. It took a long time to pack my kit, but I was doing it quick. So it, it was half the time. And yeah, I went back to Boonwa. So yeah. What was that like? So it, it's, it, it crushed me. I couldn't talk um, to anybody. I phoned my mum. She's in, why did you do that? Or why did you go back? He was out next week. And I was like, I didn't know, I didn't say anything, just put the phone down. So it was crushing. It was the worst thing that could happen to anybody that is had a sad life, uh, well, part of a sad life or a dangerous life, and then nothing to start all over again. And then, you know, you got people that cared about you in Broadmoor that have seen you back there. They were expecting to take that for a drink or something if they can. And how long did you end up back in for? No. Uh, um, say three and a half months because that's, that's, that's when the demonic side fully came out like what? I think there was one night because remember I'm sick I'm ill now I'm really ill because I had a red I, at that time I had a red result for my bloods so the medication was stopped and they forgot to write it back up again so I'm, I ain't saying nothing to them it's their mistake so now I remember the full moon and I was on my hands and knees and I was just going like that, looking up at the sky and looking down like that. And everyone was watching me on the, on the ward. Like, like 50 people watching me. So I stood up, I wore a Gucci uh, corduroy jacket on. And I burn. I've gone to get um, a, cup of, a cup of hot chocolate. I went to sleep. But I think, uh, I said, look, Move a bit forward for me, please, because you're standing too close to me. And the guy turned around and go, "What are you? What are you, my dad?" So I went, "Oh, here we go." So I had, I had this, I had this ring on here. And I pull it on there, spun around, bang. So I snapped his jaw and his cheekbone. So he's on the floor, like shaking. 
And he's got up, the adrenaline must have kicked in. So he's got up and he slipped on his blood. Uh, I think his nose was cracked as well. He slipped again. So I'm stamping on his head, stamping, stamping on his head. I've lifted him up and I said to a cage fighter, one guy there, professional cage fighter, I've gone, finish him off. And he's just written him off. And I put him down and he says, oh, cool. We didn't see what happened. Not the South said we haven't seen what happened. So anyway, I thought, all right, cool. He's dead or whatever, I don't care. Um, and I ended up in a seclusion cell. They came for me that time, big time, big, big time. I got wrapped up, um, injected. I slept on the floor naked for two weeks. And then five in the morning, um, a truck, not a van, a truck came with a squad and took me back to Woodhill CSC. What's Woodhill like? Woodhill was the best prison I've been to. Why did they take you there? Because they knew I, they knew I, I wouldn't do anything bad there. Hey, why is that so good for you? Because the people there, <clears throat> um, we actually they actually care about you. Do you feel that? Who cares? Who doesn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they will say if I was angry, not violent, but angry, they will say, "Look, we don't give a fuck about nobody else in this prison apart from you." Straight away, you know. And I would say, "All right, cool. Just calm straight down." I remember once I came out canteen. He said, canteen's only be here for another three hours. I said, look, this is canteen time now. I've got no tobacco. So I said, fuck you, man. I'm not banging up. I'm not going to hurt none of you. I'm not banging up. They would like to go for a, a, a very important meeting from the, I think, the, uh, the, the, um, the prison minister. So I said, I'm not banging up. You're all going to be late. So anyway, they said, come here, come here. And a lady, she gave me a hug. As a prison officer. And then I turned, I released myself and then... Everyone's giving me a hug. And I just walked back into my cell, I was fine. And then as soon as I got back in there, I heard but uh, and 50 gram of unbelief under my door. He said, we, we love you, man. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So when did you start getting the days that you're going to get out after 20 odd years? Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Uh -huh. What do you mean, getting out or, yeah. or waiting to get Just out? Just to get out. What you, what was it self-sabotage, wanting to kick in again um, after 20 years? No, or were no. you ready this time? Yeah, ready, yeah. Once my, I think 2016, yeah, back at Broadmoor for the last time this time, obviously my granddad's gone there, whatever. He said to me, look, we're going to let you go with staff to see a nan in Brixton. And he took me to Brixton. And I saw my nan. See, obviously the pub was gone. They had sold it and whatever. Uh, the equity and that. And they bought a little flat on um, Gresham Road, which is near Brixton Police Station. So I've gone in there and every, it was a brilliant time. I had seven hours out with my nan. She cooked food, like rice and peas, oxtail, chicken wings. Everybody ate, you know, and it was good. And then on the way back, they said, what route do you want to go down? I said, this is driving me all the way around Brixton. And we was just driving around, you know, and I thought, no one, no, no one's ever had these sort of like, you know, these little favors or. How do you think you were getting those extra little perks to try and? Because of my granddad. Yeah. Because of my granddad. Well yeah. connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's still connected to this day. It's a bloodline, isn't it? It's about bloodlines. It's mm -hmm. not about who you are. It's about your bloodline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how was that driving around Brixton for the first time in twenty years? Ah, oh, it was mad. It was crazy, man. Is that a lot of emotion go through your mind, like seeing fucking mobile phones, different cars, different trainers? Yep. Crazy, crazy, mad because... Different hairstyles, yeah, everything yeah, changes. No, when I saw it, yeah, I was like, wow, I've got so much catching up to do. <laughs> I mean, it was overwhelming. Like, my head was going... Vroom, vroom, because, obviously, I've kept up to the fashion side of things, but more what I found, Google, uh, Facebook, Instagram. I'm thinking Instagram is... Like, I, I don't even know what I thought it was. I just knew that if you're on there and you're like, you've got good videos up there of your times out, pictures or whatever it is, like you'll get followers, whether it's 50 or whether it's 10,000. But people, anyone that watches you, you put the right videos on there and show them what you're, who, what you're about, first and foremost, who you are. They don't need to show off, but sometimes people just want to share that experience. And I've done, I've done that. I've done that. I mean, I've only been on Instagram properly for about two weeks. 
Once so, we put the trailer out for this, though, it'll pop because this yeah, is yeah. a fascinating story. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. a fascinating character. You've lived the life. Thank you. And it's... Um, People will be thinking, fuck me, man, what a life he's lived. Right, but yeah. you're very well educated as well, even yeah. though you went through Broadmoor, even yeah. though you've done the shit that you've done. Mm. Like, you're still, like, yeah. you, you read a lot of books inside there? Uh, no. no? I, I didn't read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I did. I had to read, obviously, at some point. But then I'll tell you this. I don't we'll say it to anybody else because obviously he's, you know. But then the Richard Vince, uh, he's a very powerful man. Works in the prison. He's in charge of the the security systems and all of the officers and all of the governors, he's the head boss. So he came to my cell and this guy doesn't laugh. You can tell him the funniest joke, you can give him, you can give him a million quid, he will not laugh or smile, so serious. And I think they said, look, what, do you want to do a course? And I said, what? He says, um, creative writing, poetry. Um, you can even do a degree if you want. So I was paid for by Her Majesty's prison for me to do a degree in psychology and I pass. I have to do biology as well and I'm sort of on the verge of getting ready to do the exams for psychiatry. Mm. Bang on the money then, isn't it? But yeah. you're very well educated from a younger age as well. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, um, so when you got out for the first time, what was that experience for you? Um, it was daunting. Why? Because, like, I, you know, like, it doesn't matter how you, who you are, how you look, or whatever. If you haven't got confidence, like everyone's gonna feel that. So you want obviously you've been away pop like for a long time. You want you want female attention, not this for sex. This is for attention. You know, you go back to your, your house. You want to say, you know what, like babe, like, come and lie me in the bed or whatever, or let's have something to eat, or let's have a a coffee or a bottle of champagne. And I didn't have the confidence to do that at all. Mm -hmm. At all, I've just got in it back now after two years. Yeah. How does it feel to be still out after two years? Do you feel proud? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm proud. Yeah, I yes. said, I said to my, I said to like um, one of my very, very good friends last night, and he's a lovely, he's a lovely person, Muslim brother. And I said to him, next month, a month, um, a month today, he's been out for two years, and then a month after that, I've been out for two years. So he's like, our lives are identical, and it's lovely. Where's the plans for the future then, brother? And the plan for the future, to be honest, is to raise as much money as I can for uh, charities, uh, mental health charities, and Brixton for the people that are on cocaine and heroin. So I've taken in three different her like heroin and crack addicts, and I haven't given them money, but I've given them, say, I just say you got a, say a 25-year-old. So I say, look, here's a Michael Gould jacket for you. He's a, a Gucci t-shirt, he's a pair of trainers, <clears throat> and he's a pair of jeans as well. And if you want, I'll even give you a cap as well, a hat. And then I'll escort them back to where their parents live. And I'll say, look, I've spoke to this person. They, I saw them coming out of a police station. I've looked after them. I'm bringing them back to you. They've had a shower. They've had something to eat. Now please try and look after your child or your daughter or your son. And I've done that. Like, so like I said, three or four times now. So mm. that's my aim, to do that and- To give for, back. To give back. And the, the biggest thing that I want to do is for that, like, because obviously my my main person, like as a friend, brother, is uh, my brother Quincy. Shout yeah? out to Quincy. Shout out to Quincy, yeah, man. Good guy, Big man, up, legend, Cozo, yeah, Cozo, Brixton, Cozo. Mad man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Serious guy. But then yeah, there's other, there's loads of other friends that I've got as well, yeah? that I love dearly, yeah? Mm -hmm. I all love them in different ways, yeah? But I want I want to bring everybody back together. So all of the man them, all of the ladies, everybody, and then we can just be in Brixton. We don't have to go to West End. We don't have to go to Wales and all that to go clubbing and enjoy ourselves. We can do everything in Brixton. What's Brixton like now though? Brixton's high class. Yeah. Brixton's high class, man. Like nutcases, yeah. man. I know a few yeah. boys from Brixton. Yeah, 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 you know. They are proper, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're solid. Yeah. It's, uh, it is a mad community, but very solid. If yeah. you're involved and they're loyal as fuck, man. Yeah, like, yeah that, they won't miss like, it up. London, London's a fucking tough place, man. It is, so it is. It's a very it tough is. place. It's all the same as Glasgow, Manchester, yeah, yeah. Uh, Liverpool. They're tough bastards, but... Very hard. It's just everybody's upbringing, isn't it? Yeah. But it's... Uh, if everybody could get together and show love and respect each other, the world would be a beautiful place. Beautiful place. What about, um, how do you communicate, how do you function with the medication you're on? 
Uh, is there any way you can bring that medication down or has it got to stay the no, same? No, and... no, no, it doesn't, to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter how much it is of the tranquilizer. It doesn't make a difference because I'm going to go into a deep sleep anyway. The only thing that I don't like is it takes me longer to wake up. So instead of 10 minutes, it's going to be 20 minutes. And the higher it goes, it adds 10 minutes. Uh -huh. So to live with that for me is nothing serious. But then if I drink that champagne, for instance, or uh, a, a beer, or, or some rum or whatever it is, I can handle it so well because the medication is a million times stronger than a bottle of 100% mm -hmm. rum. So when, if I do have a drink, most people lose their inhibitions. They act stupid. They might get into a fight. They might fall over by mistake. But me, it, my focus is always there, mm -hmm. you know? So I wouldn't say it's a double-edged sword because like I said, with the white blood cells, but then apart from that, and the waking up in the morning, it's okay. Do you think it saves your life, this medication? Yeah, yeah. It's like other people's well. lives, basically, as well. Yeah. How do you know Yami B? Shout out to my brother, oh, yeah, Yami. Shout out to Yami, Yami, Yami. Yami. Shout out to yeah. Yami. You know, you know, Yami. <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah. yeah uh, no, nah, nah, yeah, me and Yami, uh, I, I used to go out with his cousin, Haley. Mm. Uh, beautiful, beautiful girl, beautiful girl. So I started writing to her in Franklin. So there was a crime scene that was created in Franklin. So I got Mufti out of there, put to Long Larton. So I phoned her and she goes, oh, where you are? So I'm in Long Larton. And she goes, oh, my, my cousin Jamie's there. Like, tell them that I'm sending him a card and you a card. So I've gone there and I've told him, he's like, what, what's your name? I've got, oh, we go, rah, rah, rah. So straight away, come in, come in. So with it, I haven't spoken that. And then from that day, we were inseparable. So what the schools did, they said, like, cool, these two are dangerous. There's no point in having them on different landings because we can't watch them both with somebody, you know, gets mm. in there. So they put us in front of each other in cells. So we're in there, there's no toilets in your cell. So they got a thing called night sign. You press the button and when it goes green, your door opens up. And that's like from the time you lock up to eight o'clock in the morning. So we just come out buzzing off each other. We hardly slept. Hardly set with tobacco, that, um, music, TV. When the officers started playing DVDs through the whole prison TV. So what we'd pick a film or a box set, Sopranos, for instance, which is like about a million years like uh, to watch. It takes hours and hours. So we'd watch like two, two or three of them a night. And yeah, it was good. It was uh, brilliant, man. Yeah, man. It's a legend. It's good to see him in a, a good place again, back yeah, to what yeah, he does best, 100%, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, very intelligent. Very Great intelligent. Great communicator, can speak the lingo. Yeah, he's yeah. fucking, <clears throat> obviously hurt his wobble there, but yeah, that yeah. happens as long it as he's still out so, yeah, present, yeah. which is yeah. the main priority, but <clears throat> yeah. he's a fighter. He'll he, be he's fighting strong, back he'll and he'll keep back. going, yeah. But you won't stop, you won't stop. For anybody watching, brother, that's maybe thinking of going down the life of crime, or that's maybe in the prison just now battling, what advice would you give for them? Um... I would just say, yeah, like, if this is somebody goes to prison, yeah, forget about the crowds, man. Forget about having a mobile phone in prison and putting yourself rapping with a towel around your face on Instagram or on um, on YouTube because you're probably in for hurting somebody, killing, stabbing, whatever it was, yeah? So if they're seeing you on Instagram, yeah, then they know what you look like. They know, like, what your beard looks like now. They know when you're getting out because you're talking about in your drill music. So when you come out, what they got to do? Con. And it's as easy as that. It looks glamorous, but it's not. Um, I'll give you a call. There's a guy called 6'7". Uh, you know, Takeshi. Yeah. 6'9", six, six, nine. Six, nine, so yeah. 6'9". Uh, so he was talking uh, about um, only a minute. And he says, look, there's other rappers all over the world, even people that don't rap, even people that, like a seven-year-old, they can rap better than me. But because of who I am, they never have the money that I got. They never have my success. I'm a rubbish rapper. That's what he said. So if you're in prison and you're aspiring to be in the biggest star, the biggest hitter, yeah, you're going to fail because you have to live, you have to raise your game to that height as soon as you get out. So the best thing to do is go to education, do a little bit of computer in IT. Um, maybe ask for a sponsorship so you can do like a degree in what you like. You might, if you like gym, big muscles, then maybe you can do like something in uh, sports and leisure. So when you get out, in when you are uh, in your DCAT or you're on probation, you can say to them, all right, cool, I've done these courses. So can you let me out early so I can start doing these things outside? 
So create create chances for yourself. You know, don't just be in there and ah, oh, these are they pagans or that man's ops and that. Because out here in reality, none of it is happening. If all the people that do drill music here, yeah, and I respect all of you guys, yeah, I respect all of you because you are beautiful artists. But if they done even five percent of what they talk about, they would be where I was. Yeah, over. Here. Absolutely Legend. thoroughly enjoyed this today, too, brother. No, Thank God you bless so much, you. man. Um, Thanks, man. I'll keep an eye out to see what you do in the future, brother. Say no more, man. Thanks, God James. Bless you, Thank you, brother. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.